we were discussing uh, when Brother Lumen and I did the open forum a couple of Sundays back, and we were answering an email that uh, came in from a gentleman in Australia, and I, uh, I've been kind of returning back to that in my mind since then. And I wanted to maybe attempt to help him a little more and anyone else that struggles with these assumptions and feelings of condemnation, of coming short um, as a believer. If you are not born again, you do come short. <laughs> you are dead. You are condemned. But if you're in Christ, there is no such condition. And I want to talk about that more because, again, when we, when we preach a lot of times, especially here, um, it's easy for me and easy for all of us to get caught up in the minutia, the minute details, the things that we love to talk about and are necessary to talk about. But every now and then, I think it's important that we look at the big picture because there has to be something that is complete, something that is governing everything all things as the beginning and the end. That doesn't depend on the minute details, the, the parts and the pieces, the mess-ups and the not mess-ups. The good days and the bad days that we all assess and give much greater weight to than really is necessary. And the reason we do that is because we do not have a true understanding of the absoluteness of who Christ is. Who he is and what he has wrought in the soul just by the fact that he is present in it. There is something that holds us. Like I said, there's a reality that is sure from the beginning to the end. And it's who he is. It's him. And that's very simple, and that's what the gospel is. It's very simple. It's Christ and not us. There's a need of mercy that has been extended to all who have believed. And the need for mercy was because we didn't have a hope in ourselves. For some reason, we get it twisted as we, as we go on, because we talk, you know, we present things, not us here, but in the church world as a whole, you preach things as a growing in Christ means that you are growing in a better daily life. You're living more like God wants us to live and all of those things. Well, growing in Christ, true spiritual growth is a, it's an ongoing spirit-given understanding and appreciation in the soul, a recognition and a ground of boasting in God alone that he has done in us and continues to be in us what we could never be and what we could never do. That's the gospel. We are dead. He is life. It is not I, but Christ who lives. And so... Instead of getting caught up in those things, I want to look at something uh, more of an overview and more of a broader picture. Because many more Christians find themselves with these questions than we think. I would say the majority find themselves questioning their own salvation many times. I know I did. They have these thoughts, they have these false assumptions, the battles that never seem to end, never seem to stop. So Christianity gives you a way to fight the battle, gives you a way to stop the enemy. And the gospel declares that we have a king who, has, who is on his throne as Solomon, and we'll touch on Solomon today, who has no enemy. And no evil occurrence happens within the borders of his kingdom. How can, you, how can we reconcile that 
truth with what we daily face. Well, if you want the natural world to reflect the spiritual world, you're, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's never going to happen. And that's what most want. They want my natural life to reflect heaven. No, heaven has to invade a reality that's nowhere near familiar to it. Heaven has to govern us from the inside. And in the midst of these things, we can live in the assurance of something that is not dependent, does not mess up, does not, is not hindered, is not diminished by external events or us as a third party. Because as a matter of fact, our salvation has no third party. It doesn't even have a second party. It has one who lives, who abides. And that's good news. So the false assumptions is the good news, that that is a false assumption, that we are condemned and we fall short. And the fact is, a lot of that is a result of not hearing the gospel preached. As I've said a couple of times before, the gospel is very rare. It's a precious thing. You don't hear the gospel most of the time when you go into a Christian setting. You hear, uh, you know, encouraging words. You hear a pep talk. I used to go to managers' meetings, corporate meetings with my company I worked for. And, man, we'd have the best speakers from all over the world. And they'd come in and they'd get us all riled up and pepped up. And you'd go out and you're like, "Woo, yes. Two weeks later, it was gone. You couldn't even remember what he said. So you needed another one. And that's what most people call revival in the Christian church. They just need another pep talk. I'm talking about something that governs you. When you don't have a pep talk and you don't even have a pep. And there's not one thing you can look at that encourages you. But it still holds. And it still governs. And all of that has stemmed from one divine act, and that is the work of the new birth. And I want to talk about the comprehensive, the complete power, I could say the irreversible power of birth. So, um, when man is presented a message that doesn't remove Every single thread, trace of hope, all confidence, all expectation from the earthen vessel, he has not heard the gospel. The gospel removes all hope from us. It takes out every bit of expectation we have in ourselves and each other. And it places it fully and solely on the sufficiency of Christ. And if it doesn't, it's not the truth. The truth is absent from man's abilities. The truth is, has nothing of man attached to it. And I know that's a hard saying, especially, you know, when, when, you're, when you have an ambition to be, you know, pursue the things of God, we want to know our part. Where does our hand actually touch it? Well, it doesn't. The problem is we can't seem to see the correlation between the impossible and the imputed. So we go about trying to do the impossible. What is that? Be righteous. Be holy. Be good. I mean, Jesus himself says there's none good. But God, that's a pretty high high level of attainment there, right? If you're going to try to attain that, that, basically that statement just takes it out of the realm of man and says it belongs to him. That's it. And yet the man under law, the man who had spiritual aspirations says, what should I do? I've, I've kept all of that. There's got to be something 
more than this because I've kept all of that. And you know what Jesus basically says to him? Everything that's wealth and riches and value to you, get rid of it. He's not speaking about natural things or money. In that instance, it, it, it's that, but he's speaking beyond that. He's speaking of what is gain to you. The fact that you could say, I've done all of that, kept it from my youth. I'm good. Lay it aside. Come to me. Because they understood, the, the ones around Jesus understood, how then can any man be saved? If, if that's the cry, how can any man be saved? People can give up their wealth and their riches and all of that. He's saying with God it is possible, not with man. So that's what we're looking at, the impossible. And we just try to get it and do it and do it and do it. And we have the Nike shirt and we just go after it with a Bible in our hand and we go. The fact is, what God knew as an impossibility with man, he performed as an imputed reality. He performed it by not saying, I'm going to give you the power to do the impossible. That's pep talks today. In the church. He says, I'm going to be in you what is impossible for you. That's imputation. That is something provided out of the abundant supply of another into the non sufficient fund account of another. I've accounted this to you, I've imputed this to you. So we think the impossibility just demands a greater impl implementation of a performance-based religion. But there was one thing necessary. There remains one thing necessary. It's Christ in you. Again, I hope it doesn't for us, but I know it does. It rings very hollow when you just say those words. And that's why there is a greater need. When you have an absolute like this that doesn't move but anchors your soul in the midst of your ignorance, you know what that is? That's a demand for a greater understanding of that you're ignorant of. Not intellectually. Spiritually given by God himself. God making known the greatness, the perpetual nature, the unchangeability of your salvation by revealing the one who makes it so. And anchors your heart in something that is real and never will move. So I want to read a couple of verses. We know these verses very well. And then we'll, we'll go from there. John chapter 3, verse 3 through 7. Jesus answered and said unto him, now this is when Nicodemus was coming to Jesus at night and said, you have to be of God. No man could do this unless you're of God. And Jesus just cuts basically right to the point, doesn't debate anything. Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter the, uh, the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's such a conclusive statement. Marvel not that I say unto thee, you must be born again. 1 Peter chapter 1, 22 through 25, and we'll go back to these as we go. But since you've been born again, this is from the English Standard Version. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. And... I want you to keep in mind this statement that Jesus makes to him, except a man be born again or born of the spirit, 
he cannot see or enter the kingdom of God. You remember this was the desire of the nation. They wanted the kingdom. They wanted God to finally bring the kingdom that would alleviate their slavery, it seemed like, their being in bondage to the Romans. They wanted the kingdom. Well, Jesus has just told them how the kingdom comes and how they enter in it. You must be born again. And I want you to notice that Jesus is basically saying the moment you're born again, you enter within the boundaries and the domain of a king. You don't just get forgiven. And he says, do better. And I hope this sounds, it's, I want it to sound as weighty as it is. I know my words don't make it that. But listen, you're born again, you enter immediately within the dominion of a king, the reign of a king. Colossians says the same thing, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of God's love. We have come into a kingdom that is of a different nature, a different kind. We try to naturalize it. Most people are still waiting on that kingdom to come. Jesus just told them the only way you enter is to be born again. You know what that means? When you are born again, you enter the kingdom. Not in a metaphorical way. This is what we do. We say, well, that's only metaphorically true. No, it's not. It's true or it's not true. It's either real or it's not real. God doesn't work in metaphors. He worked in that. He worked in types and shadows and he worked in parables, but he did so. The scriptures say he taught in parables so they couldn't understand it. So they couldn't know what he was talking about. Now he has spoken in son. The presence of his son is the ultimate amen, the ultimate conclusive statement, the summary of God's thought, mind, and intent is Christ living in us. These are bigger things than we imagine. So, birth has an immediate result. It brings you into the kingdom. Now, when he says, Jesus states why the new birth is necessary in John 3, 6 here. He says, that which is, hath been born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The source of birth determines the condition and state of that which is born. That's a simple statement. The seed you're born of determines everything. We in the church world may basically say it doesn't. We act like there's still two things fighting all the time, trying to gain ground on one another. But when the seed of God comes in, there's no room for the other. Bitter and sweet water can't abide in the same fountain. Good and bad fruit can't be on the same tree. These are, these are phrases that tell us that those two things can't coexist in reality. Now, we can assume it and believe it, teach it, preach it, and have a doctrine that says it does, and fight the rest of our life like you know, punching at the air at nothing and die in the struggle that truly wasn't there. Or we can allow the Spirit of God to settle our hearts in the reality of a, of a victory that God has won, of a kingdom that has no enemy, of a salvation that is without sin. And we can say, Father, show me that reality. Because until we see the big picture, again, that doesn't have the, the things that we focus on so much involved so closely and being such, such a determining factor then we can rest as we pursue. We pursue the knowing of Christ upon a basis of absoluteness, upon a basis of real, upon a basis of not going to change. So 
I don't think this thing's going to move under my feet. So I am free to pursue the knowing of reality instead of just trying to garner more of it in bits and pieces. The need is not for those who had a fleshly source, a natural source, a corruptible seed to finally apply spiritual efforts to try to bring about the change. There's something internal that has to happen. The first source has to be removed. Another source has to come. And that's the only way that the soul can be made free, set free. So, let's read. There's a lot here I wanted to get into, but I really think we should just go ahead, go into Psalms 51. I want to see how David prays, repents, asks God for a cleansing inwardly. Um, the church world unfortunately uses this as a blueprint of how to repent, how to tell God you're sorry. But God already knows you're sorry. So. <laughs> but this is not a blueprint. If it is a blueprint, I want you to see what he says because then we'll understand what he's actually crying out for and what the new birth actually does. Because this is all a cry for salvation. And it has no, it, it's not, and you'll see, we say, well, this is him praying that God will forgive him for what he did, you know, killing uh, the husband and uh, committing adultery and all of that. This is him repenting for that act. No, it's not. Look at the source he's telling God to fix what he is actually praying for. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest, meaning you're the judge of all that is good. And I'm not. Now here's verse 5. Here's the source he's trying to get across. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. And in sin did my mother conceive me. That takes it a little before the happening that we often think he's repenting of. Takes it before the time his eyes saw a naked woman on top of a building. Takes it way before that. I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Do you see the source here? It's birth. He's not saying forgive me for this thing. He's saying change the source of my birth. That's the need. Again, not getting caught up in the minute little things. Not saying sins and doing bad things are little things, but in compared to the transformation of the soul from death unto life, it's a small thing. I was shaping in iniquity. And here's verse 6. Here's what God actually wants in the soul. Here's what happens really and truly at new birth. And we'll try to get into that before we run out of time. But behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. There's where the transition has to happen. There's what God desires to fix. Not your stuff, but your source. The inward part. What actually 
determines your condition. That's what God's fixing. That's what he remedies. In the hidden parts thou makes me to know thy wisdom. We talked about the wisdom of God uh, last. We had it up here on the board. We talked about that last Sunday or the Sunday before last. I, we're not going to get back into that, but it, it goes in the 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at the end of it where he says, he has made unto us wisdom from God. That is him being our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. That's the wisdom that Paul says, we speak this wisdom to those who are perfect, those who have come to completion. This is the wisdom no man can know, but only the Spirit of God can reveal. Why? Because man's knowledge proceeds no further than man. God's knowledge is that which reaches into the depths that man cannot know and shows us a wisdom of God that does not have us as its center or its determining factor. It's, we're, we're not the star of the movie. As we like to be. Purge me with hyssop. This is the work of the cross. When you are born of God, you are enter the door with the blood on it. The hyssop was that they struck. The hyssop was used in all types of ceremonies for the cleansing of that which was unclean. They either sprinkle the blood or sprinkle the water. But the hyssop was always the testimony of a cleansing through the work of the cross. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Snow's pretty white, right? Temporarily. Never seen snow remain white for long periods of time. If it stays around for a long period of time, no. Things happen, dirt gets in it, people urinate in it and becomes yellow. That's a terrible picture, I know. It it happens. Well, especially when you're wanting to make ice cream out of it, like we did in the South. That was a terrible situation. But anyway, it doesn't stay white for long. He maketh whiter than snow. Not as white as, whiter than. Because this is not a temporary whiteness or purity. This is a purity that has been imputed from another source. It's not us that determines the whiteness, the purity, the holiness Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, blot out all my iniquities, create in me. Here's a create in me. That's the regeneration, a new creation. Create in me a clean heart, a heart that is actually clean and pure. That's the new heart that God gives to us. And renew a right spirit in me. We'll talk about that too. A right spirit, because he, he calls it a free spirit at the end of this. At least the end of what I'm going to read. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit. He's crying out for an internal change. A new birth, if you will. Something that will change the ramifications of the previous first birth that brought nothing but iniquity, sin, condemnation, death. True repentance is that. Not just saying I'm sorry and then trying not to do it. It is coming to God and falling on his mercy to change your heart, to change you from the inside, to to determine something in you that you could never be, righteous and holy. It is to change you totally and entirely and bring about something in your soul that's permanent. Because I want you to look at this, and, and we're going to focus on a particular word here. And uh, This is a Young's literal translation of it, but the King James you'll remember. In Genesis 6, 5, God sees... That abundant or great is the evil or wickedness of man in the earth. 
in every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, only evil continually. You see that word continually? You know what that word means? Continually. All the time. Never ceases. Never ends. It's perpetual. That's man's heart. Evil continually. And that is what the new birth conquers. Must and does conquer. Why? Because it brings into the soul something that's just as continual. Just as unchanging. Just as perpetual. See, we think of the evil part and we say, yeah, that's continual. I just can't get away from it. And we don't even understand the weight of that. And then over here, we don't realize at all the perpetuity, the ongoingness, the just unrelenting staying power of God's presence in us and what it means and what it accomplishes and what it does to sustain the soul in a place that is good, a place that is life, a place that is holiness and righteousness in its most perfect form, and that is Christ, spirit, truth. So the word continually will be imported as we go on. There was a continual evil. And where there's a continual evil, there is of necessity the need of a provision of a continual good or a continual righteousness. The problem is we still look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and we assess good and evil there instead of seeing it in the face of life and death. So this is actually the exact condition of what we just read in David that Paul talks about in Romans 7. As a man under the law, knowing his inability under it, knowing that every time he tries to do what the law says, how good the law is in its testimony, because of the subject matter of the law, it was good. It was perfect. It was spiritual because it had a spiritual aim, an intention, a man who would conclude it. And he knew he couldn't be that. He cries out to God, Deliver me from this body of death. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but this is the same thing. And I appreciate how the Young's Literal says abundant when he's talking about the evil that is continually in man's heart. Because it takes you right back to Romans 5 where it says where sin abounded in abundance. Grace has super abounded. The greater abundance of the grace of God through the work of the Spirit has superabounded, has changed entirely that state of being under the rule and headship of Adam and brought us under the headship and lordship and kingship of Christ. And, and we've talked about that before when it comes to the headship and the sovereignty of a king. And we'll talk about that a little more uh, before we end, but we read in Romans 5.20, the law entered that the offense might abound, be shown to be abundant. The sin, the transgression of men be seen to be abundant, where, but where that sin abounded, the grace of God much more abounded. So David here is confessing that sin was not a result of a multitude of actions. It was hereditary through birth. It was a seed that was by which, of which we were born. He confesses his sin, his hereditary sin, as the source that was the root of his actual deeds that we call sinful acts. But there was a source that, that governed it all. problem is in Christianity most people just focus on the deed. We don't even talk about the hereditary part of it. That we were born in sin. Born dead. So we look at this person and say they're more of a sinner. Even if we don't do it out loud we think it. They're more of a sinner than them. So they need it more than they do. 
<laughs> we're all born just as dead in sin and corrupt and uh, evil. Doesn't matter. I don't care if you smile a lot. Doesn't matter. If you're not in Christ, evil is present. So that's why focusing on the deeds, we transpose that like we look at unsaved, unregenerate, and we just transpose that over into the Christian life and we still focus on deeds instead of the source. Because I'm telling you, the source doesn't change. Unless there is a real strong party that comes in and changes it. And the one, if you're born again, that came in to change the original source is one that can never be overcome. That's why I wanted to say the irreversible nature of birth, because it is. It's irreversible. But most people would argue with that, and I don't want to start an argument. He can change from death unto life, but nothing can change it from life back to death. There's no kingdom that has that much power to overcome what he has done and what he has wrought in the soul. No, not at all. So, we give our full attention, or should, to the internal comprehension of righteousness. Not trying to get more of it, but to comprehend what God has imputed by new birth. Something that is not of works, lest any man should boast. In other words, the new birth takes your boast out of the picture. It takes it all out of it. You couldn't boast in your sin, and you can't boast in your righteousness. I mean, like I said, I've said this before. Most people, when they give their testimony, they'll reach back into their bad, bad past, and they'll say, man, I was really bad. But Jesus saved me. And that's their testimony. And they'll go through the litany of things like drugs and blah, 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 and then talk about it. And, okay, I'm glad you're not doing that anymore. But you know what I could say? I never did any of those things. But you know what I can say? I was dead in sin, separate from God, condemned, but I was born again. I was brought from, life, from death unto life. My soul is now brought out of darkness into the light of God himself. And you know what? My testimony is just the same as the other guys. He's just focused on all the little minute details. But guess what? My birth, his birth wrought the same thing. And it didn't increase by any action on my part. And that's true of being in Adam or being in Christ. That's true of being dead in sin or dead to it. It doesn't get greater that you are more and more dead to sin. You just, as the Spirit of God shows you Jesus Christ and reveals him in your heart, you become more and more aware of the greatness of a salvation that he has provided, of how great and absolute it is that he who is dead to sin has brought you unto himself that your soul may share in his condition, in his state. That's what it is. It's not him giving me my condition that I can screw up. At any drop of a hat, I can slip on that proverbial banana peel and I'm out of Jesus. I just read an article written by Spurgeon. Theologian of theologians, everybody loves. He was still saying that being in Christ is only, and being in heavenly places, and being in the holiest of all, is just for a select few of believers who have attained to a certain intimacy with God. And that would be, that would be ridiculous if it wasn't the idea and the understanding of a great majority of Christians. They're still fighting to get where new birth has brought them. They're trying to super glue their feet to a shaky foundation so they feel like they're not going to move at any moment so that they can actually grow. 
in the understanding of their salvation. They're still trying to get the salvation part down. They're still not convinced. So I'm going to skip a bunch of this. <laughs> uh, too, many, too many notes, but this is a matter of life and death. Comes down to that. You either have life or you don't. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. And he, in the literal show you, it's the definite article. Has the life. He does not have the life if he does not have the Son. That's how simple this is. That's how real it is. That's how unmovable it is. If you have him, you have all. So, I wanted to get into what David said with the truth and the inward parts and all of that, but I'm going to skip that. And I want to show you a couple of places. And I wanted to do it while we were over here the other day. We ran out of time. Um, first of all, this is what Peter says with regard to our salvation. This is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Let the, let the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed, who impelled us by his abundant mercy, and caused us to be born again so that we have a hope that lives. This living hope, having been made actual through the instrumentality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from among those who are dead, resulting in an inheritance that is imperishable, incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away. Which inheritance has, is laid up now, kept guarded in a safe deposit in heaven for you, who are constantly kept by the power of God, through faith, for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last season. Now, I want you to hear the words that fade not away. I want you to hear the words that are kept by the power of God. That's what is ready to be revealed for those who will look. A salvation that doesn't fade. Remember what we said about the evil of man's heart? Continual. The salvation we have received is continual. It fades not away. And that source that holds our soul from within keeps us guarded. The reality is guarded, is kept it's kept from your hands and my hands. It's kept from corruption. It's kept in a safe place. Where's that, Christ? And it's not going to move from that. It is a, it is a non-fading, imperishable, undefilable salvation. The Weiss Word Study says, Our salvation is as undefiled as our great high priest is undefiled. I said at the end of the open forum the other Sunday that for us to lose our salvation, the one who ensures our salvation by abiding in us would have to lose his place. He would have to lose his right to sit on the throne for us to lose our place in him. Again, some people would argue with that and say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. But it's absolutely true. It's an anchor that truly does hold. But it's not an anchor that holds us at a distance from him. He's the anchor that holds us. It's who he is in us. It's nothing he gives us that could slip away at any moment. He is why it doesn't fade away because he is constantly, continually abiding in heaven for us. Before the sight of God, he confirms our soul's status. It 
So we see this in a couple of pictures, and I want to just look at that real quick. It shows us that this is realized in, in a man. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 29 through 38, we're going to read those verses. We've got 15 minutes. Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goes in into the holy place for memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart. You see, he's trying to emphasize something, upon his heart. Before the Lord, what's the word? Continually. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it. And as it were the whole, her badgering, that it shall not rent, and beneath upon the hem of thou shalt make uh, make pomegranates of blue and of purple and scarlet round about the hem thereof. And bells of gold between them round about. A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister. And his sound shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord. And when he comes out that he die not. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold. And grave it upon it like the engravings of a signet. Holiness to the Lord. Thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it shall be upon the mitre, and upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. It shall be upon Aaron's forehead. Now, listen to the words here. We've already said this is continually. He says continually, over and over. It shall be upon him continually. He will stand upon uh, in, in the presence of the Lord continually for the people. Here's the thing that combats the continually evil of man's heart is a continual abiding of our great high priest in the presence of God for us and abiding in our soul. It shall say holiness to the Lord. Now, shall put it on blue lace. It may be upon the mitre, for in the forefront of the mitre it shall be, and it shall be on Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall always be upon his forehead. So first we see it never is removed from his forehead, always on him. But why? That they may be accepted. Before the Lord. That's such. Man that's beautiful. How are they accepted? What do they have to do? How much do they have to offer? What gifts do they have to bring? There were laws and all of that. But look at this. Here's what it's all about. This one. Standing there in God's sight. With holiness to the Lord on his head. And he does so that they. Because of him, they will be accepted. Accepted in the beloved. That's the picture we have here. It's always on him, but they benefit from it always, continually, never moving from his head. They partake of his condition. How do they partake of holiness? They are known of God in the one who stands before him. And it says holiness Unto the Lord. There's the perpetuity, the continuance of our salvation, and how it's determined in one and not in many. And that's seen in our high priest. And one more place we'll see as well. But when it says that he will wear this as a memorial unto the Lord, uh, the word memorial is, is, is really. Important. It speaks, it speaks of remembering, but it also says remember and give your full attention to. 
It's on him as a memorial, meaning as long as he wears it, God's full attention is set on him. And he remembers his covenant because he sees this one as the embodiment of a covenant. There's where his attention is set. Fully. And as long as that one stands there, you'll see the words like where he remembered Noah. It's the same thing. That man that he saw righteous, he remembered him. He gave his full attention to him and saved him and his household. God remembered his covenant with his people. That's the same word that is used there. He gave his full attention to it. When it says that he wears it continuously and always upon his head, it's the word, it's 8548 in the Hebrew, and it means to go on without any interruption. How many interruptions are we told that we have all the time, right? Everything we do is an interruption to God. My stuff, my thoughts, or whatever, it's always an interruption. God's salvation interrupted because you're an idiot. No, my idiocy, if my idiocy had anything to do with it, I'm just going to go float on the Buffalo River. which I'm sore because I did that the other day. <laughs> Didn't float, but we're fighting. Um, big man going in a boat, it doesn't work good. Anyway, the, you know, the, the, the continuous nature of this is what I want to get across. And it continues because he continues. He has a priesthood that continues. He has a, it doesn't end because he's going to die. He ever liveth. And him ever living and continuing is the intercession for my soul. Him standing there as the assurance of my soul's state. That's the continual validity of my soul's salvation. And what do we do? What's our part? Knowing him. God revealed that one in me. Show me that one. If I can just see that one, you know what I'll do? I'll stop trying to boast in anything that has to do with me, and I will rejoice in the fact that he has done it and is all. So the life of the believer, regardless of what people say, is not fraught with interruptions, stops and starts, resets. I've hit the reset button. I thought I did. Let's start over, okay? Say that to God. God's not like your wife. You know, your wife, your wife, let's do this again. I'll go back to bed, wake up, and we'll do this better today. I won't say that again. God's not like that. There's no triviality here. God has secured us from the beginning to the end in something that is continual. That holds us when we can't hold ourselves. Which is all the time. Now, um, when it says holiness unto the Lord, let me just say this. This is not a verb or an adjective. It's a noun. Say, so what does that mean? It means holy it in something. He, it's not just a description of an attribute. Like you say, man, he's holy. No, he has holiness on his head. You know what that means? He is the full definition and meaning of the word. It's not an attribute he has. It doesn't have a meaning unless it's affixed to him. He's holiness in its totality standing there before God. That's important. So... It's affixed to him continually. Stop, stop, stop fretting. Stop fretting. You know why? Because we just come back and fall on the mercy of God and we're still where we've always been. And we can carry on in the knowing of him. In Solomon's case, we see it in the high priest and we see it in the king. Solomon's case is found in a couple of places that we'll read. First Kings um, chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. For he had 
dominion over all the regions on this side of the river, from Tifsha even to Azza, over all the kings on the side of the river, and he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. You know, they dwelt safely. Why? Because he had peace. They dwelt safe because he had peace. They were governed and the rule of a man of rest was over them. And they benefited from his condition. A man of peace had peace all about him and they dwelt safely. What's the duration of this safety? All the days of Solomon. As long as he reigned. This is also, again, pointing to the testimony of the greater than Solomon that rules his kingdom. That we entered into by new birth. Again, new birth is the moment we enter into the kingdom of the greater than Solomon. And guess how long his kingdom is ruling? There is no end to it. So if we use the same testimony here and say as long as he ruled all the days of Solomon and we apply that to the greater than Solomon and say they dwelt safely and at rest and at peace, how long do you think we can do that? Eternally, forever, because he rules. He is king. First Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. And Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants unto Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the room of his father. For Hiram was ever a lover of David. And Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, Thou Knowest how that David my father could not build a house unto the name of the Lord his God for the wars which were about him on every side until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. Now that's a beautiful contrast in David and Solomon of the putting away and the establishing and putting away of all enemies and no enemies. But now the Lord my God hath given me rest. Solomon speaking. On every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. That's the, that is the condition of his kingdom. God has given him rest. And because of that, there is no adversary. There is no evil occurrent. The land rests from all of that. As long as he rules it. And 1 Chronicles 22, and we'll stop. Verse 9 and 10. Behold, a son shall be born to thee. This is God speaking to David, who shall be a man of rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon. And I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. So long as he's king, they have peace and quietness. Again, Of our Solomon's kingdom, there is no end. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son. Do you think there's a testimony here? And I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Continual. So how long will they have peace and quietness? Forever. Now, of course, this doesn't take place in the type and the shadow, it breaks down as it always does. But it doesn't break down in the greater than Solomon, in the truth of this testimony. This is a reality determined fully, completely in Christ. And how do we enter this dominion? When is there truly a moment where we come within the borders of his kingdom? When we were born of God. When we were born of the Spirit. Again, that's the governing reality in which and under which all the other things, all the minute parts and details take place. But it takes place under the governing 
power of I am the beginning. I am the end. And that's unchangeable. Our souls are secured. And our salvation is absolutely anchored in the simplicity of one man standing in the presence of God for us. One man governing. One man being unto God and determining for us God's entire delight and pleasure. May we ever grow to know this one. May our souls be unveiled to that which has no veil on it. So, amen.